Hello there, I'm Black Bright and I'm broadcasting out of the UK, uh, around the world. And what have I got for you today? Well, I thought I'd let you have an insight into policing strategies. I mean, most of us, we see the police and we just either see them on the street or we see them zooming around in the cars or we see them in the stop and search scenario. We see them in all kinds of different situations. So it's never occurred to me before that they apply different policing tactics to different situations and different people. I don't know if you, I don't know if you knew that, but I definitely didn't know that. I also didn't know that the strategies that they use in poor areas are totally different from the strategies they use in rich areas. In rich areas, they have this, um, what do they call it? Service style policing. So, and in poor areas, they have legalised policing. Now, I'm going to go through the different types of policing um, styles that they use. And you might find this quite interesting. Well, I do hope so. Um, okay, they have the broken windows policing. Now, broken windows policing is where they go into an area. You know where you go into those areas where, you know, they're fly tipping, windows are broken, the area is, you know, made into a kind of a slum. They have that kind of, that's called windows, broken windows policing. It's a criminology, it's a criminology, it's a criminological, criminological, yeah criminological theory that shows visible signs of crime, antisocial behaviour and civil disorder, like broken windows, garbage, fly tipping. It is believed that if left unattended, it affects people's attitude towards the area and the environment and leads to more problems. And people tend to stay away from those areas because they look so ghastly. Um, there's low levels of formal and social control, and but the police can disrupt and neglect um, disorder by their presence. So what they're saying in this kind of policing is that the police won't necessarily do much unless they see obvious crimes, but just by their presence, they're hoping that um, people won't exacerbate the disorder. I mean, it's not as if somebody's going to start throwing rubbish right in front of a police officer or start smashing windows in front of a police officer. So they believe that their presence alone, I believe, will um, curtail that kind of um, area. We have problem-oriented policing. This is to correct what was once termed the reactive incident-driven standard model of policing. New problem-oriented policing approach requires police to be proactive in identifying underlying problems which can be targeted to reduce crime and disorder at their roots. However, the problem with this type of policing is that if they have unconscious bias, they are going to predict a certain type of behaviour and they're going to predict a certain kind of outcome and they're going to be reactionary because they're going to be based on their unconscious bias in dealing with that situation or in dealing with that problem. So, um, black people are seen as a threat from the get-go Black views are assumed to be older, less innocent and inherently guilty, which creates a problem because with their unconscious bias, if that's how they perceive young black boys, they're going to treat them accordingly. And if black people are seen as a threat, they're going to react towards that threat, whether that threat is real or perceived. The police decide which laws to enforce, a process known as discretion. James Q. Wilson identified three styles of policing, watchman style, legalistic style and the service style. The watchman style distinguishes between the two mandates of policing, order, maintenance and law enforcement. So reactive policing can be defined as the police responding to a specific request from individuals or groups in the community which encompasses immediate response to calls and follow-up investigation. It's this kind of um, reactive policing 
that prompts stop and search um, and random searching, um, which serve to make young boys feel unsafe in their own communities. It's how aggression and violence is justified by the police for under 18 youths. Because this is, you know, a lot of the police, they do react. They should be emotionally intelligent, but a lot of times they react on fear and on, on perceived threats. And when they do that, that's what causes um, unnecessary violence, um, what they call it, unreasonable force and all that kind of stuff. It's all up here. It's all in the brain. Um, extrajudicial killing. Now, um, even though we're not in America, we've all heard of Trayvon Martin. That was an extrajudicial killing. Um, it's not a policing tactic, but it is. It is in a way because what happens when they uh, in this kind of situation is that, you know, the law doesn't intervene. Um, it's the killing of a person by governmental authorities or individuals without the sanction of any judicial proceedings or legal process. That's the saddest kind of policing where they feel they can kill and get away with it and they're not accountable to anyone, not even the um, PCO or whatever they call it. They call it now. It's not the PCO. Anyway, I'll come back to that. Um, policing strategies extend beyond traditional models of responding to calls for service and often seek to increase crime prevention, intervention and response effectiveness through techniques such as community outreach, efficient resource distribution, crime mapping, crime data collection or suspect location. Um, what does that mean in English? Community outreach, that's just meaning, you know, blending in with the community, being a part of, you know, like when you see these bobbies on the street or even when they're at the carnival. Um, crime mapping is where they perceive where crime is going to take place and they map out the areas. Crime data collection, well, they do that through the biometrics. They do that with um, their, what do you call it, their body cams. They do that with the facial recognition systems and suspect location, which is where they assume suspects are hanging around, you know, these high crime areas. Proactive policing can be defined simply as police work initiated by law enforcement agencies or officers that is intended to de deter crime, reduce disorder, reduce citizens' fear of crime, or remedy other specific concerns in a given area. The thing is, proactive policing should be positive because if they're planning ahead, you know, and they're planning to, um, you know, negate crime or prevent crime and they're trying to do it in a proactive way, that should be a positive. But what they're doing is in their proactiveness, they are actually um, using their unconscious bias to perceive how a crime is going to occur and where the, the areas in which crimes occur and they're being proactive based on unconscious bias which doesn't work all it does is stigmatize an area and it stigmatizes a group and it stereotypes a group that's what that does that kind of policing um, they've got something called co-active policing is defined as a strategy based on the police working cooperatively with other agencies to identify and address the conditions needed to improve community safety. Now, this will be something like the police working with Nexus to pick up illegal immigrants, you know, while they're on the street and they get in touch with the home office and they have immigration offices in the police stations and that kind of thing. That is what coactive police, that's what I understand by coactive policing. You know, other, other people, other agencies are all involved. Um, invisible policing, that's what we see now with this um, facial recognition camera. Um, facial, yeah, facial recognition camera. This is covert surveillance dis using discrete tactics like bi biometrics, body cams, face recognition cameras, algorithms, um, it's legitimacy, its legitimacy is often challenged. It relies on deception and concealment. Civilians often do not know they are being policed. Equipment used is often biased to disadvantage race, race gender and age. Convert, covert policing goes unnoticed 
and has become normalized in today's modern society. It is not considered as morally questionable within the modern police organization. So what they're saying is, is that, you know, how they're policing now, they don't have to be visible. So you can think, oh, there's no police about, but they, you are being policed in one way, whether it's through um, biometrics, whether it's through your phone, whether it's through face recognition, whatever they're using, they're using it and they could be using it from a distance, they can be using it from street cameras, they can be using it in a wide number of ranges. And just because the police aren't visible doesn't mean that they're not policing. So that's what invisible policing is. The only thing is, is that technically, um, people should be informed when they're being watched, when they're being recorded, and that kind of stuff. But, c'est la vie, we live in a modern world where we're open to anything now. Um, I just wanted to read this. Dr. Loftus emphasised the increasing volume of covert policing authorisations and the interception of communications commissioner office in brackets IOCCO, reference to the institution over the institutional overuse of the regular the regulation of investigatory powers act let me say that again such a mouthful dr loftus emphasized the increasing volume of covert policing authorizations and the interceptions of communications commissioner office in brackets iocco reference to the institutional Overuse of RIPA, which is a 2000 Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, which governs the use of intrusion, intrusive and covert police activity. While Maguire has attributed its increase of use to global threats and as a proactive method to manage risk and technological change. So, like I said, you know. Um, that is that covert policing that we don't know we're being policed. Policing styles vary according to the area and type of community. The watchman style policing is focused on resolving disputes informally to maintain order, but not on proactively preventing disputes. An ordered community is a safe community. That is their logic behind this. Um, foot, that could include foot patrol, seen as a deterrent in crime, in high populated areas. It distinguishes between law and order, maintenance and law enforcement. It, it combines a little bit of discretion and the law. That's the watchman style policing. That is where you might find that if a police stop, a policeman stops you because you've you driving without your lights on, he might use his discretion and say, look, you're driving without your lights. Is there a reason for it? And if he's a nice cop, he might say, well, look, you know, I'm not going to give you a ticket this time. Just be careful and make sure you switch on next time. You see, that would be watchman style policing. But yeah, anyway, I'll say that. So uh, the criteria is that they ignore minor infractions, such as traffic, minor offences. They try to resolve minor issues without involving other agencies. So that's the ideal um, method of policing, I would say. You know, they are aware, you know, they use their discretion. They're not petty, that kind of stuff. Um, legalistic style of policing. This is what I think they use on black people and poor people. Um, it's an emphasis on violations of the law and use threats and actual arrests to solve disputes. The strict enforcement of criminal law, they, they use the law to the letter. This is a Trump style um, policing, um, using formal methods as opposed to watchman style, which uses informal methods. There's no discretion, no tolerance. Um, the criteria is that in quotes, professional, civilian contact, formal, neutral. The rules are supposed to apply, apply across the board, but we know they don't. Decision making is top down. So whatever they say at the top goes down. And I, I'd like to rename that the Trump star policing. That's what I'd like to name that. Um, service star policing, an emphasis on helping the community as opposed to enforcing the law. They place emphasis on community opinion, 
and this style of policing of occurs in middle to upper class society high levels of discretion which means they probably get away with most things unless because they're so well off and you know there's a lot of money going into the police fund they use a lot of discretion in these in these areas um, so the criteria for that is high emphasis on common con community and public relations less emphasis on minor infractions more focus on crimes that violate a civilian's privacy such as burglary and robbery they make arrests only when necessary they keep communities safe from intruders and outsiders they protect welfare of civilians within community boundaries there is an abundance of financial resources they have the most current technological equipment and the area is usually high status civilians so they use a totally different tactic of policing than they do in the poor areas i mean really policing should be uniform and standard across the board there shouldn't be preferential treatment just because you live in a rich area i didn't even realize that they had different styles of policing um if you are interested in the different styles of policing, James Q. Wilson wrote Varieties of Police Behaviour, the Management and the Law in Law and Order in Eight Communities. And this is where he examined the behavioural patterns in eight police departments in 1968. So, that is the different styles of policing. I'm going to... Um, now I know that what they, they use different styles of policing to different areas. I'm going to do another video which um, will try and say, you know, how you don't look like a criminal. Because this is what it's based off, really. If you look like, you know, certain areas, you know, they just expect you to look like a criminal. And I'm wondering, if you don't look like a criminal, whether their strategies will change. Anyway, that's all for now. Bye-bye.